Hey guys, it's Malls. Thanks so much for listening to Please Advise. Just a quick message before the show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. It's super helpful for us and super helpful for you. You can also call 323-450-7408 to get your calls on the show. Again, 323-450-7408. Or email askpleaseadvise at gmail.com with your voice notes or emails. Thanks so much. Hey guys, it's Please Advise in New York again. Again, I don't know the episode numbers because I don't know how this is going to work. We're just going to air them as kind of mini episodes. And today we have someone that I love so much. She was one of our first people to ever contribute to Hello Giggles. She was in consideration from day one. As soon as we started thinking about what we were going to do, I was like, we got to get that girl Ruby from Tumblr. You guys, it's Ruby Carp, author genius, brilliant young woman. Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm good. And we should acknowledge as well that your mom is here, but she's going to yes. stay quiet until you have to go to improv class. Yes. Um, so you are 17 now? Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> it's That's absolutely wild. So you're, I, did just, I just found out from you that you only have to be 16 to take a UCB class to me, which is yeah. shocking. Yeah. Um, what goes on in class now? Um, well, I'm, I'm about to start 301 today. That's why I, like, shouldn't be late, which is why I have to duck out early, because I feel like it's like, okay, you can be late, like, once you know everyone, but when you're making a first impression on everyone, and you're, like, walking in, and you're, like, you have your school bag on still, and you're, like, oh, sorry, I'm, uh," then, like, that makes everyone uncomfortable. No, it's Um, smart. So, but, uh, I just, I've done 101 and 201, uh, and basically I just finished all the basics of improv, Mm -hmm. and... 301 is when we start learning about heralds. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I have not started the class, but I'm like, uh, I think this is when long form improv starts becoming a thing. It really steps up. I remember the difference between two and three. I started them the day after I, I started three after I finished two, and I had the same teacher for both. And when it started as three, she clapped her hands and she turned to us and she goes, guys, this is three now. Like, step it up. Uh, not yeah. to intimidate you. Oh my God. Okay. Um, no. So, who's your teacher? Lydia Hensler. Lydia Hensler. That was Marcel, you guys. Hi. That's my mom. Um, so, Ruby, tell me about your book, Earth Hates Me, True Confessions from a Teenage Girl. I can't believe you are – This is, it's in hardcover, you guys, and has a big picture of her on the back. Oh, my God. It makes me so uncomfortable. I, like – the book comes out on Tuesday, but – I was in Barnes and Nobles and I was doing an event there, so they were selling it as like a everyone can get a signed copy if they enjoy the panel. Mm-hmm. And I saw that they were like on sale, and it was the first time that I had seen my book like on sale in front of people. And I saw like two girls who looked around my age looking at the books, and I was like, "Oh my god, I can't be here! My face is blown up on the back cover. <sighs> this is the worst experience of my life." I mean, I think it looked, no, I think that's amazing. Why, but why was that traumatizing for you? You just felt like it was too, I, I was Natasha just like, oh my God, Leon, this is so much. Natasha Leone blurbed you? Yeah. Girl, you have small stars on here, Paul Shear as well. This is very exciting. I'm very proud of I you. I am very excited. Um, so tell me about the book. Okay, so it's nonfiction and it's basically stories from my life about what it's like to be a teenage girl and not in like an annoying like this is them I'm a teenage girl and I'm relatable. Mm-hmm. It's just like <laughs> it's the 10 different topics that I think are the most crucial in being a teenager in today's society. So it's boys, it's heartbreak, it's social media, it's feminism, it's family, it's friends. It's just everything you go friends like it's everything you go through when you're a teenager and I at first wanted it to be like a self-help book and I was like okay I'm gonna like be uh, inspiring and like help kids but it kind of turned into more of a memoir in that I realized that I couldn't relate to teens and make teens feel like I wasn't trying too hard without talking about stories from my life Mm -hmm. so basically every chapter starts with a story of mine or a personal anecdote and it basically goes into a bunch of life advice yes but it also is like my thoughts on the world and what I've observed in being a teenager and the different things I think we need to improve on and just stories from my life and how that's impacted who I am as a teenage girl today. Girl, come on. I mean, you guys, that is, I mean, you just pitched that like a pro, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, saleswoman. I think you, you did great. This is, I mean, it's, wow. So I want to know about social media really quickly because mm-hmm. I feel like I would be complete. The only way that I got through 
and life as far as I have is because I did not have social media as a teen. Mm-hmm. So what uh, what do you touch on in social media in particular? What do you think is unique to your generation's relationship with social media? Well, it's so weird now because social media is so important to us and we all hate it, but we all love it. And mm-hmm. it's like this weird relationship because we're all really, really aware of it. Like we're all very conscious of the fact that we can't do anything without Snapchatting it, or we are all constantly refreshing Instagram and Facebook, and so much of dating now is doing different things through social media to lead up to... It's just like all of these weird components have come into being a teenager because of social media, and it's not that it's changed it in any huge way, because... When you're a teenager, you're still a teenager. It's like not like some crazy yeah. new experience. Everyone who's a teenager at any point basically goes through the same things, just different circumstances. Now the circumstances are we have so much technology. Mm-hmm. No, it's so true. I, uh, I, this, th- it's just like the number one breeder of misery in my life. I think Me too. it's everyone. You know, like, but you also at the same time. I think all the time, oh, I would love to just delete it all, but there's so many memories on there. It's Exactly. It's, you need to have it. To, I mean, people are freaked out when you don't have a Facebook. People are freaked out when you don't have that stuff. So it's like I, to, if I met a guy who didn't have an Instagram, I'd be weirded out by that. I would think yeah. he has a lot of secrets. Well, what I talk about this in the book, what I like to do is every few weeks or whenever I feel like I'm getting too addicted to my phone or when social media start, starts getting toxic, instead of deleting my accounts, I'll just – delete the apps for a few days mm-hmm. and just kind of detox and I do that try too. not to be on my phone. And then a week later, I'll redownload all the apps and I'll go back to doing my routine. But it's nice to know that I'm capable of disconnecting. Yes. No, that's great to know. And and by the way, that's good advice for everyone out there. Ruby, normally I make people give three reasons why they're qualified to give advice, but I feel like you've already given 25, so we <laughs> don't have to put you through that. But I uh, no, I do that all the time. It's like, if you guys just see if you can delete your apps for, for yeah. like a week or two. Give it's yourself It's really that. nice. And it's also like, it really makes you feel in control of everything you're doing because yeah. it makes you realize how unnecessary social media is because I feel like we all think that it is so important and that we can't live without it. But really, all that happens on social media is just photos and things that aren't important. If someone really needs to talk to you or has something really important to tell you, they can text you because if someone needs to talk to you that badly, they probably have your contact information. Yes, no. Or they can get it from someone, you know what I mean? I did like catch someone like kind of low-key stalking me online because I she was I was like, "Why are you like why are you the first one to check my snaps but you never text me?" And I like literally called her out on it. She was like, "That's a good point." And she yeah. couldn't explain it. I'm like, "Because you're watching me." to mock me or something. Like, it's not it's not pure. Yeah. I, I feel like sometimes you got to hold people accountable for stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I also probably shouldn't have fed into it, but you know what? I'm not perfect. But that's um, life. Yeah, that's life. Um, thank you, Ruby, for making me feel better. <laughs> um, so I want to just get into our, our calls while I have you here. So yes. um, this is one that I have not heard yet, but cool. it's labeled feminist dude. So I want to know. I think oh, this be, okay. I think this will be good for you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm calling from San Diego. Uh, I was just at a bar, and sorry it's not a voice now. I know they're better, but I just wanted to get this off my chest. There was this bartender there that kept calling all of the women sweetheart. And I just thought it was really fucking weird and really inappropriate because he would only do it to women. And I said something, and I was like, hey, dude, that seems fucked up. You just can't call every girl you see sweetheart. That just seems weird and inappropriate. And he got really pissed off at me and said that, you know, he he's a bartender. He knows what he's doing, blah, 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 blah. And this is San Diego. It's not like I'm in the fucking Midwest. This isn't like some, like, Ma and Pa bar in Ohio or something. But is that, like, weird to say something? Like, I I felt like it was weird and... None of these girls were saying anything. They were just kind of like playing along, but I could tell that it was fucked up. But did I do the right thing or should – I don't know. Anyway, if you have any feedback on that, because things like this happen all the time where you can see – like I see women just being like, ah, ha, ha, like that shit's not funny, but they don't say anything. And I guess there's a lot that goes into that. But it's funny because I hear people rambling all the time 
on these voicemails, and I'm like, just fucking spit it out. But now that I'm leaving a voicemail, I'm just rambling. So I think you get the gist of it. Uh, if you have any other questions, you won't. You get it. Uh, have a blessed day. Bye. Oh, my gosh. So, I, yeah. So first of all, Ruby, I don't know if you've had any experiences with alcohol yet, but it sometimes makes people want to talk a lot more than they need to. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. Also, sorry for all the F-bombs. Um, that was a good call, though. And something that I think that you and I might have different opinions on simply just because, I mean, I'm going to guess what I think your opinion is. I honestly compulsively call people sweetheart, doll, baby, girlfriend, what's up? I'm very much like that. So I wouldn't think, I know that I wouldn't think much of it, but also this is where I can be, I think, a victim of our universe sometimes and then I'm a little bit tuned out. But he did point out. out that he was only saying it to women. Yes. No, I know. I mean, that's so, like, where I can be inappropriate. I mean, yeah. I sometimes don't always realize all the ways that we are, we face injustice. I never think, of, I rarely think about being a woman, to be yeah. honest. Well, okay, I was at a restaurant with my best friend. And every just so you all know, like, my best friend and I were both 17. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, I'm not going to say, like, I don't look my age or I do look my age. But, like, I look like a teenager. Like, I don't look like I'm in my 20s. I don't look like I'm 15. I literally look like I'm 17 years old. Like, if you look at me, that is the age you would guess I am. And I was sitting at uh, a restaurant and we were seated right next to the bar. So the guy who was the bartender was like our waiter, server guy. And from the second we sat down, he was like, definitely, like he was very much like flirting with me. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, <laughs> I like laughed and I was like, oh, I'm flattered, but uh, stop. Because uh, this guy was clearly not 17. He was clearly somewhere in his 20s. And throughout the entire meal, he would not stop coming over to us and hitting on me and just being really creepy. And my friend and I were like, we are clearly trying to have a dinner and a conversation. And it literally got to the point where my best friend had to turn to him and go, we're in high school. Yeah. So stop. And the thing is, I think it's so funny how when people are put in positions of power, and it's not like being a bartender is a position of power, but when you're put in a position where you have power over what someone's, someone's drinking, experience, someone's yeah. experience, you have to serve them. These people think they can take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. And it's awful because I know you say sweetheart and baby and stuff like that a lot, but this guy does not, if, if it was the way this, the guy who called is yeah. describing it, I don't think it's, I don't think his intentions were pure and innocent. And I think that's probably why he got really upset when the guy said something. Yeah. Because, you know, drunk people say stuff all the time to bartenders that they just, you know, they brush it off. Like, you know, you're, when you're serving people alcohol, there's always that element of whatever. But um, first of all, tell me the name of that bar because I want to beat that person up. Um, <laughs> that makes me so mad to hear that. Secondly, like, so that's so, I'm so glad that you, first of all, are this way and have friends that would say, that know to say something like that. I think that I don't, I don't know that it really occurred to me. I thought it was very sad and weird that a lot of, there'd always be that older guy that would come, that would buy people alcohol for parties or whatever (laughs) when I was in high school. But I definitely uh, don't think that I would have been aware or alert enough to be like, oh, this guy is perving on me and that is wrong. Um, I'm proud well, of you for and that. And it's not even it's not even about the fact that I'm in high school. It's about the fact that I and like even if I weren't in high school and he was just hitting on me, I'm having a dinner with my friend. Yes. She also easily could have been my girlfriend. Like he doesn't know that. Like he <laughs> like I don't like I don't understand why these people feel like because they're working somewhere and they see someone attractive, they can take advantage of that. Like yes. when you're at your job or, like, you're not, like, when clients come in, you're not like, oh, they're cute. I'm going to start flirting with them in my meeting. Like, yes. And, and like, I obviously, like, a bar is different than, a, like, a client situation. But it's the same thing. It is a workplace. Just because it's a more casual place where people happen to get drunk and, like, have dates there and stuff. Like, it's still the same thing. Like, you're getting paid to be there. You have a manager. Like, do your job. And that's it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You're so smart. I love you so much. Thank you. Um, but, yeah, no, to this guy, I don't. I mean, look, I don't know how to undo the fact that this guy yelled at you and blew up at you. I'm sorry he made you feel bad. Um, yeah, but you problem. were not wrong for saying anything. And I think that 
you know, when I saw Christina labels these phone calls and I never am in charge of the board. So I did not know what this call was going to be. When it said feminist dude in parentheses, I was a little bit afraid about what this call was going to be about. <laughs> and I'm glad that someone like you listens to my podcast. That makes me feel really good because um, you're smart and you're responsible. Oh. Um, okay, Ruby, let's take one more call before I have to let you loose soon, right? What time yes. do you have to go? Uh, I should, uh, like, I'll start gathering my life together around 610. Okay, perfect. Okay. Not like leaving, but like gathering my life together, just like getting ready to yeah. depart. You'll be you'll be mentally organizing mentally that. Mentally preparing. Okay, got you. Okay. Um here's another one. I'm not sure what this one's about. Hi Malls, Christina and guests. I am a 34-year-old girl living in the Bay Area and I'm bisexual and I really like this 22 year old girl I have other options but she is definitely in an explorative phase and I'm having a struggle over how much I should pay for her when we go out she essentially dropped out of school but she has a very lucrative potential and she's starting out in some junior jobs just to work up her potential and so eventually she'll do okay I'm sure but right now just living in a very expensive area I find myself paying for her but I also am realizing that she's starting to expect it and so my sense is that I should put the brakes on that but I still want to hang out with her and I like her so what should I do should I just try to find free things? Should I just say, hey, come with me if you want to get a ticket, here's the link? Or how can I address this in a way that is not going to put a damper on our mutual exploration? Um, Because there aren't that many femme bi girls out there. And I have um, a couple of girls that I've talked to in my age range, but um, Mm -hmm. they end up with serious boyfriends being bi girls so help me out Christina I know you may have some thoughts on the subject do I keep paying for this girl do I back off is she just using me or should I just figure out a a plan to have that financial boundary thanks okay I also have a little update from her as well that says um the girl I discuss has invited me to dinner on her anywhere I want to go. Aww. That's good news. She's willing to give and not just take. I have also decided to treat her like a fr- um, just treat her like a friend because I don't sense she's mentally where I am in her life, but I do enjoy her and enjoy talking with her. Um, I mean, I, I, that's the first thing I was going to say is what are you doing at 34 dating yeah, a 22 Yeah, that's what year I was going to say. Well, the other thing <laughs> is like, yeah, I feel like not to be like there's other fish in the sea, but like. Uh, someone, and not that I know a lot about being in your 20s or 30s, but I feel like from what I've seen in rom-coms and what I've observed <laughs> from the people I've met in life, people in their 20s are still, even if they're like, huh, I just got out of college, so I'm a real person. Like, no. <laughs> they haven't, they are not real people yet. They are in, like you said, a very experimental time in life because they're, the thing is like, I've, I'm in high school. Looking at me three years ago is terrifying. I cannot imagine what 12 years would do. And I feel <laughs> like obviously it's different when you get older because you're stop becoming so big of a deal. And But I just think that if this is a thing that's a really big problem for you, and I'm not, I don't think paying is the biggest deal in the world. I think it's a courtesy thing, and I think if you don't want to be paying, I don't think she would be like, oh, how dare you not pay for me? I think she'd be like, yeah, I agree. Like, that's probably messed up, and I shouldn't really be doing that. But I think the real thing you should think about is, do you really want to be seeing a 22-year-old? And not to be like, hmm, 22-year-olds, you guys are not uh, worthy of 34-year-olds. But like, No, it's just not appropriate. Yeah. It's not, they're not, I, I'm telling you guys are in different places in your lives, mm-hmm. like completely different places. Like you are of an age where you're like a person. You probably, I mean, like, I, I'm not going to speak for you, but you probably know who you are a lot better than someone who's 22 knows themselves. And let me just say, someone who does not know themselves is 
definitely not going to be what you need as a person who does know yourself well. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And by the way, you are so dead on. I know you haven't lived your 20s yet, but that's exactly it. I don't think I'm, I should be held accountable for anything I did before age like 31. Yeah. I don't think I became a real person. I've, I said to, I'm very like, uh, I'm always saying to people like, you got to practice forgiveness, especially with people in their 20s more than anything, because I'm still trying to get forgiven for things that I did when I was 30. So mm-hmm. like, and I, that's like three years ago. So yeah, exactly. I, um, no, it's not actually. How old am I? I'm 33. I'm 33, you guys. Um, I can't believe I forgot how old I was for a minute. That will happen too, just so cool. you know. Um, but I yeah, was going to say the paying issue, like, I mean, I kind of, I mean, I don't think it's messed up that she expects you to pay. I would expect, if I was 22, I would expect a 34 year old person to pay for me. Like, if I, and also, do you live in San Francisco? You said you probably make decent money. Like, I'm not, I think that if someone's 22 years old, they probably have student debt over their head. Yeah. Also, you're kind of taking her for a ride. So, like, I would expect someone to pay for me. Um, I know I always did anyway. Um, well, also, like, uh, again, I don't know much about being in my 20s or 30s, but if I think about it like a freshman versus a senior, like me as a senior, because uh, that's what I am, I literally cannot even fathom what is happening in a freshman's mind. When I see a freshman <laughs> walking around, like a freshman boy walking around the school, I'm just like, oh my God, you have so much to learn mm-hmm. just about being a person. Granted, teenage boys are very different than 22-year-old women, but the age difference thing, an aspect of it, she's probably really intimidated about the fact that you're 12 years older than her because that's a really big age difference and all of her friends are probably all for like 22 year old like fun club friends are, always, are probably like oh my god like 34 like you're old to her yeah yeah like, th- you're uh like you're probably like a big deal to her uh, for that reason and i feel like with that and with that maturity aspect of it though you may not feel like you're like some big deal like 34 year old it's probably, like, a really big deal to her. So it probably isn't, like, it doesn't really surprise me that she would expect that either just because she probably thinks that you just can. Mm-hmm. What about the money aspect? That's that's the thing. No, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, she probably thinks that she just, like, can pay for things because she is a person. Like, she is an established person. I've gone out to dinner with people who are wealthier than other people, and I've, you know, like, in, in general, like, they're just known to be wealthier. And, like, the, I've heard them say, no, the rich person pays. And it's, I kind of agree with that. And I know yeah. it's terrible. But, like, Ruby, if I were to take you to lunch, I'd never be like, hey, so are we, like, splitting this or is this on <laughs> you? Like, I would pay for your lunch if we went to lunch. So, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Marcel? Actually, I want to know what you think. Um, I think, uh, and again, I'm 53, so I have a really very big My mom dated a 23-year-old when she was 46, so she knows about this topic. (laughs) So I know a lot about age differences, but I do think when you are more established in your lifetime, it's incumbent upon you to to pay. And, you know, the, I'm... I was bi also in my youth, and when in dating somebody of your sa- the same gender, it gets a little murky, mm-hmm. but really it's the person who has more of a career, more of an establishment. If you're dating a 22-year-old who can't pay for coffee, and I want to go to, like, um, you know, the Spotted Pig, we're going to Spotted Pig, and I'm paying for it. And I, again, like, I'm dating someone now who's a lawyer and who's, like, a little bit younger than me, as they usually are. <laughs> he pays for everything. But- You know, because he makes money and I'm in between jobs. Yeah. Well, I think that's actually a very good point, too, is that the person who has more, who's more established or whatever, I don't want to have my options limited because I'm dating someone who's not making a lot of money. I work hard to have options. So, like, if I want to go to a place, I'm going to take go there and pay for the person. Exactly like that. Exactly. Um, But I do think, you know, just as a rule in general with dating – if you're being paid for, there are things you can do to show that you are very appreciative of it. You know, yes, maybe. So so to all the 22-year-olds out there who are getting paid for right now, get dessert. Pick up ice cream or something for you guys. That's um, Bring a flower. Yeah. Also, I think you can't get hung up on money. Like yeah. the, to the thirty-four-year-old, it just it gives puts bad bad vibes out there. It makes the other person feel even more insecure. Just don't be petty about money. There's nothing less. It's like a, the biggest turnoff to be petty about money. I completely agree with you. I did. I got into a little bit of an argument with someone recently who 
was prideful about their cheapness. And I just was like, that is a disgusting quality to me. And I was very like vocal about it. I just said, there's, I don't think there's anything that bothers me more than cheapness. And um, they were like, well, you don't know, you know, you don't, you don't take pride in, um, you know, that sort of thing. Like I love to like pinch pennies and scrimp and save and do this stuff. And I mean, yeah, you know what, if you want to be frugal, that's one thing, but cheapness is, is basically it's taking advantage of people um, as much as you can, as far as you can. And I just think it's so, so gross. And I, I also agree. It's gross to talk about money. And one more thing I want to (laughs) say, um, I, uh, if if you're at a, if you if a check has to be split more than three ways, the richest person at the table. If you're the richest person at the table, just put your fucking credit card down, please. Like I yeah. can't handle watching people divide a check. It it, it makes me want to cry. <laughs> um, it's so try being a teenager and splitting the check with your friends who are all also just as broke as you are. Oh no, I mean trust me, I I remember that. I remember the days of like going to get a pizza and everyone's counting out seven dollars and thirteen cents. Like I remember that. Well, but. you also have the problem of your friends taking advantage of you always paying for like mm-hmm. your lifts and your Ubers and so oh. yeah. And yeah, you, that's a big thing. You're like the one with the unemployed parent. I know. <laughs> yeah, all my friends have moms with jobs and like have money but I happen to always be the one paying for things and my friends are always like oh I'll pay you back like I got you on the next one and I'm always like guys like you have parents who are making a steady income like my mom is literally like officially on the government list of people who are unemployed yeah like I don't understand yeah damn what, Rubes, where are you earning money? I mean, I know you just wrote a book, but before that, <laughs> what were you, where, where, how do you, how do teenagers make money in New York City? Well, uh, I had a job this summer. I worked at a pizza shop. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, I was kind of living. I mean, like not living. I was living off my mom's money, but mm-hmm. my like my my leisure money was money I was making from writing for different websites mm-hmm. and occasionally I'd get like an article that I'd get paid a lot of money for for no reason. And that would, like, supply me with money for, like, a solid, like, two months. Yeah. And then something, luckily, would just, like, come up and it'd be, like, kind of the same thing. And if all else failed, I had my bat mitzvah money. <laughs> yes. There's always that good bat mitzvah money. I lived off my money for my 13th birthday for – or my 16th birthday, I think, for, like, many years. No, yeah. It's, like, good money. Yeah. Like, it's, like, a lot. It's, it's a good business to be in. I'll tell yeah. you that. I'm very reckless with money. You like, are? <laughs> very – because the thing is, like, I'm a very in control person in every single aspect of my life. So when I got a, like a lot of money to spend, I was like, I work so hard. I deserve to spend money. Mm-hmm. And then I just spent like so much. Your whole on, advance, basically. <laughs> yeah, like on nothing. Like on things that <laughs> did not need to be purchased because I could. And I, it felt so good to be able to just like buy myself like expensive things just for the sake of buying expensive tell the things. Story about that. No, yes, I tell, no. That, yes, tell that story. It's a good one. It's a good I got lesson. Scammed into buying. It's a good lesson. No, this is like literally the worst story of my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll leave after I tell this story because I'm too embarrassed to face the the pain of the aftermath of telling the story. So basically, <laughs> I was walking on the street and this man like pulled me and was like oh, let me touch your hands. And I was like, ah, okay. And then he was like, come into my, like, face cream shop. And, like, it looked really legit. Like, it was, like, this, like, beautiful (laughs) store where they sold, like, Israeli, like, face creams and stuff. Do you remember what cross street it was? It was Epidermis or something. No, no, what street? Oh, I have no idea. Sorry. Um, It was right by where I got my senior photos done. So I don't know what that means. That doesn't mean anything to you. It means nothing to me still. But... So anyways, if you look it up on the internet, like, it will pop up scam artist location. But anyways, <laughs> so I go there, and they, like, pull me in, and they're, like, they're like putting all these, like, things and creams on me, and they're, like, look at how clean we're making your skin and all this stuff. And by the way, I'm, like, explaining it really fast, but, like, at the time, like, they were they were becoming my friends. They were they're asking me about myself. Aggressive. They were really aggressive, and they were, like, oh, you're so beautiful. You, you're Israeli. We're Israeli. Like, we started talking about, like, my birthright trip that I'm going to take next year. Like, we got to, like, bond and and, like know each other and like they really just like I was like oh my god these people like care about me and they were like okay these products normally cost like a thousand dollars but we can give them to you for like 200 and we'll give you two if you pay for the price of one 
And I was like, oh my God, I can't turn down that offer. And I was like, why aren't you guys like in Sephora? Like Sephora, like, or I feel like if you guys are like this big, they were like, we work with NASA and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I feel like if you guys are like this really established brand, like, why aren't you guys in Sephora? And they were like, oh, because like, we're too big for them. Like we like, we, we don't want them to like take over our brand and stuff. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. So basically they kept me there for like an hour just like talking to me and putting creams on me and before I knew it I spent like $500 on like these face creams and I was like so happy because like apparently they were worth like a thousand dollars and all this stuff and now I know Wait, like and then you called me and, and then I called so my mom and I was so excited and I was like mom like I got so many face creams for like such a low price because they are actually worth so much money I was so excited and all this stuff And then I went on the internet and I looked them up and the Yelp reviews were like, because they told me they would like give, let me use their points. They were like, they were like, oh, I like you. So I'm going to use my points on you. Mm. And I was like, what are points? And they were like, oh, we're going to like, I'm using like my own personal account to like make this cheaper for you. And I was like, oh, awesome. Like, thank you so much. Mm. There, there's no such thing as points. (laughs) So I looked them up and everyone's like, it's a scam artist place. Like, do not shop here. Like, like it's a horrible, like they will make you spend so much money. And I was like, okay, you know what? I messed up, but I'm going to go back and return everything. No refunds. Oh, no way. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not letting this happen. Like I'm not, like I'm, I never make stupid decisions. I never really screw up. Like I'm a perfectionist. Like I never really get in trouble. I was like, I'm not letting this happen to me. I'm a drama major at my school. I played the music that I play whenever I need to cry in a scene. I pretended to start having a panic attack. I run back inside. I'm like, oh, my God, my mom just called me. She's screaming at me. She's unemployed. We don't have the money to pay for this. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, can I please? Like, I'm, like, literally, like, in their shop bawling, like, hyperventilating. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm, like, literally, like, having a mental breakdown. And all these people are just like, oh, my God, what do we do? There was a small Jewish girl crying in the middle of our shop. (laughs) And they were just like, I'm sorry, we don't do refunds. And um, that was that. And then I literally never went back there again. Even though they gave me a free fa- facial, I did not go to it. Oh, Ruby, that is not that bad. I think almost anyone listening to this is falling. I've fallen for things like much more less. Uh, no, that's it. I've I've done worse today. Um, like th- that's not bad at all. In fact, like I have a very hard time. In situations like that too, because I know that these people work on commission. I start to feel bad. I think yeah, that they me spend too. too much time with I just me. also like I'm a really gullible person. So when people yes. start to like bond with me, I'm like, oh my god, like we're bonding. Like this is amazing. Like I this like I I have a new friend. These people like me. I just it's I'm a mess. That was a really hard Self-esteem lesson for issues. me to learn too. Was that not every, like and really I learned it much later than that. Like I literally. <laughs> maybe be like 29 or something starts to realize like oh not everyone has my best interest in mind yeah like I, this yeah. is not this is a solo mission right now yeah um can i take a picture of the tv yeah yes okay thank okay. you so much Bye, for having sweetheart. me molly congratulations go do level three i, I love, love you so much you're welcome for being here of course and um next time we're in la we gotta do something okay okay yes all right bye bye go rock star Ugh, Marvel. Earth Hates Me, you guys. It's Ruby's book. Check it out. I'm so excited for it. Okay, I'm going to have a cough drop really quickly. Okay. You guys, so this is Ruby's mom, the Hi. creator of Ruby. Marcel is Hi. here. Um, she's done an amazing thing for this world in bringing in Ruby, but she's also someone that you probably know. She's a super cool person. Everyone knows you, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, like if I just say like Marcel, people know – people everywhere I go, I meet people that know you guys. That's amazing. Yeah, That's it's so very cool. true. You're world famous. We're like – we'll be the like next generation Kevin Bacon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would love that for you. And by the way, we're getting a lot closer than six. I was thinking the other day, I'm like, I think I have two degrees between almost any person I can think of. Um, it was really like I was. It was like wow, the world. I think it's social media. Everything's just getting a lot smaller. We're all getting together. So, Marcel, do you want to answer some questions with me? I would love to answer questions. I want to do an advice podcast so badly. So this is like my favorite thing right now. You would be so good at it too. I think also everyone's kind of good at it, which is why I like changing the guests up a lot. Is because 
no matter what anyone does, everyone has a really unique slant. Like really like their career informs them, their lifestyle, their background. You'd be really good at this. Also, like, as Ruby said, as she outed your age, you're 53, which means I am. Um, which means you know, I, I love it when we get a guest in our 50s because they've seen more of life. They just get it. I mean, I don't really respect and, and when, Ruby is 100% different. You have the most articulate daughter on the planet. But when I have, a, like, a 25-year-old on, I'm like, dude, what do you know? Um, <laughs> um, okay. Let's play a call for you. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Oh. Hi, Malls. Um, I'm in a situation here in Florida. Our brother uh, left his dog with us, and we took care of her. She's very needy. She's a Packer Spaniel. He did to go get to power, and that's fine with us, but he's just a selfish asshole. He's been living with us for a year now. He cashed out his 401k. Uh, he was a teacher. He had an inappropriate relationship with a student, and um, now he's living with us for a year and a half. His dog is here. I love his dog, <laughs> but uh, we told him he has to move out at the first of the year. He's very upset. He thought that he could live here rent-free for two years while he goes to school for MRI tech or whatever he's doing. And uh, none of the family is supporting us. And my husband lost his job seven months ago. And uh, his brother lives here rent-free, has money. He cashed out his 401K, is not giving us any money, totally dipped out in Irma. It's like, I, I don't even know. I don't even know how to talk to his family about this. My, all my family lives up north. We're not that close. But his family is really close, and they think everybody should take care of each other. But he's 38 years old. Like, I, I don't know what to do, except we gave him a time to move out. We gave him a year's notice to move out. And now his grandmother is calling me constantly. Oh, if you make him move out, he has to move out here into her house and I'm like no he has to get a job and move out. like he has $14,000 in the bank I don't get it anyway Molly I just want to know how to keep this kind of family separate my family never asked me for anything I never asked them for anything and we're constantly taking care of this family and it's hurting our marriage I don't know what to do please advise Okay, I love this call so much uh, because, well, first of all, this is the kind of thing Dr. Laura would fix very quickly. <laughs> Dr. Laura would just say that, like, I would leave your husband. That's what Dr. Laura would say because his relationship with his family is sick. Um, I really think that this is a, you can't enable a person like this because he's obviously. So I think she was saying she left. He left to get his power. It seemed like he dipped during Irma. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm, I'm a little un. That's I heard that later, but then it seemed like almost like, is she talking about like el electricity or is she talking about like? I'm not sure because even though I took notes, but um, I agree with you, Molly. I think, I think you know, it's very complicated when you enter a relationship with someone. You have this relationship with the man, the man or the woman, and it's just the two of you against the world. But then families come into play, like your family, his family. And and when you have different family relationships and different family values, you have to ascertain what you're willing to put up with and what you're willing to demand so that you can either keep the relationship or escape the relationship. Um, the dog is an innocent bystander. I actually think that you should leave your husband and take the dog with you. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I don't, and I know you're probably thinking, ugh, why do I have to suffer? You're actually suffering more by putting up with someone 
and I know you love your husband, but you're putting up with a man who's willing to put his family before his marriage. Yeah. And you don't want that. No, you don't even you have kids yet, it sounds like. Like, what's going to happen when you have kids and your your husband wants to go to a poker game with his brother and that ends up being a binge for a week and you're left home alone with the four kids? Like, you don't want that. And maybe exa- Exactly. And maybe that's a lesson that he needs to learn. Maybe he doesn't realize that when you marry someone, you are starting your new family that you prioritize above your traditional old school nuclear family like it's not about your mom and dad and brothers and sisters anymore and it's I'm not saying to turn your back on the idea of family I'm just saying that your husband obviously like his wires got crossed somewhere and he didn't realize that his responsibility is to you and you know what there's also a really good chance that he's not going to learn that lesson and there are plenty of people out there that would tell you I think you can agree that like they would say oh like that you're the jerk in this situation. There are plenty of people that don't have a good sense of boundaries and don't have a good sense of what is fair and what marriage is and what what you're really signing up for, I think, which is why I am kind of terrified of getting married and I'm like have grown extremely disinterested in it the older <laughs> I've gotten. I don't know that I want to be that selfless, um, basically. Um, but, you know, there's a chance that he won't learn his lesson. There's a chance that you can go, you salvage your life now. Like, get out now. Don't, Marcel, you, what you said is so right. That if this is exactly the kind of guy that would put his family above his own kids, I think. Yeah, and you know the 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 reality is like um, you don't have to be married once. You can be married a few times. You can mm-hmm. be married twice. Like even though you don't want to be, even though you make a vow for happily ever after, in the first marriage you see all the things that you don't really want to put up with. You don't have to put up with like. The brother is just a symptom of what else is wrong with your relationship with your wow. husband. Yes, that is so true. There, that is so true. And by the way, I don't like his family. I'm just going to tell you that. Not into them. I'm not. I'm, I don't understand them. No, I like the dog though, and I think you should keep the dog. I think it's weird. With the, I agree. I, I think <laughs> I think the dog is great. You and you're going to need a buddy. Um, but I do think that like this is it's weird that he has parents that are letting him get away with this. Well, it's like the grandmother's getting involved and calling you and making you feel like you're the one that's wrong for asking to have your marriage back. You know, uh, you're right. If someone's pushing 40 and sleeping on your couch and your own husband is also unemployed and going through his own depression, you have enough to deal with. You don't need a second child to, you know, a second man child to deal with. You have to deal with supporting your man. And if you, if your man is not able to see that, like, every, that this is not a healthy situation, maybe you need to take care of yourself. Yes, and also it's just not healthy to be around people that are sitting around all the time. And, like, you imagine the amount of sitting around that's going on at that house. <laughs> like, these don't sound like particularly inspired men. So, like, I don't no. think that they're, like, using their unemployment time to better themselves. Um, I just realized something. I'm in significant pain today, and I thought it was I'm because I, I – No, 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 thank you. Um I'm all, I'm always in like I am always at like a three. Um, but I woke up really really hungover today, which I know means that one of the bartenders that I saw last night gave me te- or did not give me Tito's because I can only what's drink a Tito? Tito? Uh, Tito's vodka. Oh okay. Um, which is like a gluten free vodka. It's made in Austin. It's like a very just. It's like it's kind of it's just a shade above well. It's not expensive at all, but it's the only one I can drink, and so. I can always tell when a bartender gives me well or gives me even just like Grey Goose and calls it Tito's and charges me retroactively. Like I, I always know. And um, maybe not in the moment when I'm drinking it, but I know the next morning. I realize I'm also in a lot of pain because I – oh, no problem. I'm also in a lot of pain because I did cupping yesterday on Canal Street on a, on a whim. I just like impulsively wanted to – You just this, walk into a random place. Yeah. and Because I just – I needed some body work. I knew I needed something. My feet hurt so bad from um, from traveling and everything. And so I was like, okay, I definitely would love like a, like a 30-minute foot rub sort of thing. And then the guy was like, your body is jacked. And I was like, I know. And um, so we do cupping here. So he does cupping on me. And he left some of them on a little bit too long. And he told me this when he pulled it off. He said, oh, that was on, that one was on for too long. Um, so I've done it. I've done cupping many times in the past. But, like, it maybe gets, like, a little – I'm purple and brown. And that is why I think my body is, like, detoxing in Let a major your way. Back. You're going to die. So, some of these are so dark. I love how you come to New York and you get so much done. Oh, my God, yes. You're right. Yeah. No, no. 
No, a couple of those places. He went too far with you. Yeah, some of those places were a little bit too long. So I, you're right. And by the way, I completely overbroke myself. Every time I come here, it's never a vacation. I think, oh, I have to check my email later because I... Because you do that thing where you're like, I have to go to Brooklyn and see my friend who's related to my aunt. And I, because I, you know, I've seen you come a couple of times now yeah. over the years, no. over the last almost 10 years. Well, like, I'm like a sucker. Yeah. Like, I you I'm, go everywhere. I am such, I am so easy. And we're going to maybe have lunch with Justin and maybe mm-hmm. I'll see you before you get on your plane. And like, you're, you're doing all this stuff. And it's like, <sighs> I canceled on someone today and I felt so bad about it but I just was like recognize your limitations yeah like you can't be and when I was in LA I was in LA in June for three days mm -hmm. I was staying at my friend Jen's house in West Hollywood where I lived in the 90s with her and I just was like I have to be at this conference during the day I'll I'll see people on site I have too many very very close friends in LA Mm -hmm. I can't tell all of them that I'm here because everyone will have like a nervous breakdown that I didn't make time for them this is my good news, though. I have decided, and you're right, everyone has a fucking nervous breakdown. Get it's really never hurt. a normal reaction. Yeah. Um, and I will say that, like, I only know this because I've seen people come to L.A., like, and then seen them on Instagram and been like, like, you didn't tell me. me you were mm-hmm. here. Um, I'm coming back for my birthday, I think. I'm going to do my mm-hmm. friend Jolie's show, so I'll be here in January. Um, what sign are you, by the way? I'm a Pisces. You're a Pisces? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm like eating a... No, I mean, I enjoy it because I just burped. I'm ASMRing very hard right now. But the other thing is I really like seeing my friends. And it mm. gives me so much pain to be in L.A. Not And, of course, I don't drive. So to be in L.A., not have autonomy over my body, to get myself from one location to another, except via Lyft, Uber, whatever. Um, it, it does give me great pain. Yeah. It no, really it's, re- it's too hard. I get There's people all the time that are like, especially now that I live in Glendale... When people come to town, they're like, do you want to go to pump? I'm like, no, no, no. I, I can't. That's not like a just quick pop in, pop out sort of thing. That's an hour drive for me. Um, I have major respect issues around the time it takes to get places in L.A. I think that I've actually had a conversation. It sounds so douchey. I had a conversation with my agent, and I just said, like, if you send me on a general meeting in Santa Monica at 4 p.m., I know you don't Guess have what? respect for exactly. me Guess because what? I'm in car. I'm in that car. If it's like pitching or something that's like could be a lucrative situation, I'll drive anywhere. I don't give a shit. But um, I am not going to go for a general meeting that will result in nothing. Get get in my car, drive into traffic, and then drive out of it. I would drove to Beverly Hills the other day. My meeting was at five p.m. I didn't get home till nine thirty. Like if that's too long to be in a car, that's an entire audio book. Um, okay, let's take another call. Yay. I love these calls. Have you ever done cupping, by the way? No. And also, I don't drink alcohol, which is why I asked what a Tito was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you never drank? Or no, I've never been a drink. Uh, I, 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 I don't like the taste of alcohol. I don't like the way wine tastes. I don't like the way beer tastes. I don't like any of it. That's like Kim Kardashian. Oh, me and Kim have so much in common right I now. I know. Are you, are you at all excited about these Kardashian babies, by the way? Um... I've been really not. Uh, have to pay You're not attention. keeping up. You know, I have this blog called barbmagazine.com, dot mm-hmm. and it's for women over forty. Mm-hmm. So if I see anything about the Kardashians, I know none of them are forty, so I just bypass mm-hmm. anything I see about them. Right? There's like that. they're not coming up in my Google alerts. Kim might be turning forty soonish, though. I think she's probably like thirty eight now. It's wild. No. Um, Wait, so but 20-year-old Kylie, this is what I want to know. You're a mom. Yes. They're very excited that Kylie is pregnant. She's 20 years old. She's pregnant with a guy that she has known. She was they, – they had been dating probably like two or three weeks when she got pregnant doing the math. I don't understand why they're excited about this child. I would be – yes, they have all the money and stuff in the world, and, but my mom had me at 21 – you were a young mom as well. No, I had my baby at 36. You did? That's, Why do I yeah. always think of you as such a young mom? Because I look... You're right. Yeah, I look youthful because I haven't, didn't do alcohol. You're yeah. right. <laughs> you're right. You're, you're right. Actually, that um, makes total sense. I think because uh, the mom, the matriarch, Chris Kardashian, had 45 children. Mm-hmm. So for her, procreation is a very natural uh, way of being. Like, sh- it, if you've had more than two kids, you're more than likely did not have many abortions or many decisions to you know, or miscarriages or she she probably is like yes we we are we are fertile myrtles we this is what we do she's not thinking 
she's not thinking about the other ramifications or the consequences of having a baby at the age of 20. Also, she's thinking, I get to have another baby in the house. Yeah, there's and that. That's probably what she's thinking. And, You're right. And the girl who's 20 will put the baby, will, you know, has seen her sisters have children. She doesn't know yet what she's in for. And her mom will take care of it. That's true. That is true. You're right. She's going to, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. It's just madness to me. I can barely like tie my shoes when I was 20. Okay. No, I agree with you. I'm just being, yeah. oh, this is my empathy. No, like, no. And empathy. by the way, God bless you. Someone has to be empathetic. I think a lot of people, there, there were a lot of people that spoke out against this and then there was a backlash for speaking out against it. And I just, I'm not, I don't really care enough to say anything either way, except for, I just don't understand why it's a great thing that a 20 year old is having a child. Mm. They no, are I children. Would, I would be concerned if my child came home and was like, I'm with child and I'm thinking about having it. I mean, I would support whatever her decision was, but you know, I, I having raised a child by myself, I know exactly what's ahead of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, that is so, uh, why wouldn't I, why would I, I mean, I know why I would think you're a young mom, but like, I just did the math. You were just here with Ruby, <laughs> 17 years old, and I, I Malls, you're it's crazy. It's okay. It's Girl, okay. you crazy. Girl, who does math anymore? I don't. I mean, okay, so here's one more call. All right, I'm taking my notes. Hey, Malls, Christina, and guest. Um, so I'm calling because I'm going through a breakup, and I have like, probably a hundred questions about it, but I think the thing that's sticking with me most that I can't really talk to anybody about is what you do with friends from a past relationship during a breakup. Um, I'm really surprised and disappointed by how many of our mutual friends have failed to kind of like even ask me if I'm doing okay, um, let alone show up in any way whatsoever. And then I do have one friend who, in an attempt to be supportive, has been completely overbearing and is, like, mad at me that I'm not over it yet. And she's, like, I've told her twice, I think, to, you know, kind of, like, calm down. Hey, I'm just here to complain. I'm just here to tell you that I'm sad. And um, and the the way that you're giving me feedback isn't helpful. And she doesn't really seem to get it. So... Do I need to cut her out of my life too? Um, So yeah, I think I'm just looking for advice about how to manage friendships after a breakup when people aren't really acting the way you would expect them to. Please advise. Oh, Oh, I know. I feel so bad. And I I will say just like to just first, because like I'm sure you're gonna have something much more um, no, I'm not. wise to say. <laughs> no, no, it's truly. Um, okay, so I went through this not that long ago when I, but I didn't expect anyone to stay my friend because my ex has a TV show on the air, and we live in LA. Well, like, who's gonna pick me? So I realized people are terrible. Um, I've realized that I am so. Gr- I'm not. I'm not upset about the ones that are gone. I'm so grateful for the ones who have made a point to not be political or to stay in my life or have even chosen me. That means like everything to me. And so that to me, I, I think of it much less of like, oh, like this person isn't speaking to me. I I can't. I don't. Th- I know this isn't 100 percent applied to your situation, but if you can at all just be thankful for the ones that have stuck around. I think that's a really good thing to focus on. It's always going to hurt when people leave your life that you thought were a part of it because they really cared about you too. Um, But, you know, you also don't know what's being said about you or, you know, that is that is the scariest part is that you are when you end a relationship. That person knows where all the fucking bodies are buried, man. And you don't know what they're saying about you. I'm not saying that to make you paranoid, but I just want you to know that you might have an opportunity in the future to explain, actually, that motherfucker's crazy too. And we both were, both lost our minds at the end of that relationship or whatever it is. Um, That's just, that's how I've kind of dealt with it. Um, But I also haven't handled it the best either. It's really difficult. And this is one of those calls that you can't put a bow on the way that, you know, when people call and say, how do I erase this life feeling that everyone feels and that's just like, you know, notoriously bad and inescapable, um, I can't make something like shame completely disappear or whatever. Um, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about. One is 
you know, aside from the mutual friends, who were your friends before you had this relationship? Uh, not everyone was a mutual friend. Seek those people out. Um, oftentimes when we get into relationships, we get caught up in our per, our person's social life and we forget about the people we had before them. Uh, in terms of the mutual friends that are not really standing up for you, I think it's a- acceptable and don't be hard on yourself for feeling the feelings of disappointment. People are as you are, as I am, as Malz is, we're self-involved. We're only thinking about ourselves all the time. Well, maybe not me. I'm thinking about Ruby first. But like, we're almost always only thinking about ourselves. So you're the one going through this breakup. You're the one going through these feelings. The mutual friends, mm, they're not. They're, they they want to play basketball. They want to go to Chipotle. Like They're going to call him. They're not going to call you. It's okay to feel left out or like hurt by it. A lot of that is transference anyway from like losing this relationship. And then in terms of your overbearing friend, I'm I'm the I'm the friend that's always like snap out of it because you do have to have it's good to have a tough love friend in your life. It's good to have someone that doesn't enable every single whim of yours. I I had a friend in in my 30s uh once who who was in her 20s. And all she did was like, like she would constantly beg me to like call her ex and tell him some lie about her and, you know, blah, 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 like suck me into this whirlwind of her chaos. Really? Yeah. And I was just always like, no, yeah, no, I got other fish to fry, literally. Yeah. Like I got, I got food to cook for my child. Like, so, so these are the three things. Seek the friends you had before you had the relationship and hang out with them because oftentimes when we get into relationships, we forget about our other friends. The second thing is like embrace the feelings of feeling left out and being hurt by the mutual friends, but accept it. Understand that they have to make their own choices and it really has little to do with you. And then the third thing about the overbearing friend, she's just trying to help you. Um, And even though you want to talk about your, your feelings all the time with her, Go back to point number one. Find your other friends. I almost took the overbearing friend thing, and maybe I. This is where I tuned out because I started. Sometimes I tune out and start thinking <laughs> about my answer. Um, <laughs> but I, I was under the impression she was just basically saying that she has this friend that's like, just you know, when you're like grieving or something. You know, when you lose someone. When we lost my grandparents and my family. My mom actually wound up marrying this this guy later, my stepdad, uh, who she also just divorced. But oh. when they first started dating, oh, it's fine. Uh, when they first started dating, um, my grandparents both died in like the same week, and it was like a t- obviously a terrible thing in our family, and it was like good, you know, it was just traumatizing for all of us. And my stepdad's whole attitude and why my mom ultimately broke up with him the first time was because he was like, hey, like you know, like go out like let's you know go do this thing and my mom's like I don't want to like I'm dealing with this right now and going to a concert isn't going to fix that for me and I do think that there's something that's okay about setting a boundary and saying like hey like if you went through a breakup now I know that this is how you want to be treated because obviously people do like like Marcel said like people are also very self-involved and they assume that you grieve or that you process the same way that they do um, and that's not, that is definitely not true. And there's like a million ways to, to go about these sort of things. So if you feel like you want to tell her like, Hey, like point taken, like I get that this is how you deal with this sort of thing, but like, and I am so appreciative that you want to make me feel better, but this is actually not helping me. And I know that that's what you want to do. So if it, I don't think there's anything wrong with setting a boundary. I think that it, it needs to be worded carefully. You know, you don't want to seem like you don't, and with friends, don't wait until you snap. Like I thankfully have a pretty good relationship with all of my friends that I consider like my best friends, which is that if I'm mad at them, I'm just like, hey, I'm mad at you. Like right away. Because I can't have, I can't run the risk of letting that spoil. And it sounds like you're really valuing the friends that you do have right now. So like honor that friendship by being honest about it with a person. Anytime I found myself in a situation where I couldn't tell someone that I was mad at them or that they had disappointed me or anything else. Um, that really, I've, it's, I now know to recognize that as I don't feel comfortable with this person. And that means that they are not really my friend. Um, so, you know, maybe there's something there to look at for you. Um, what, how would you say that to someone? 
would you say that to someone? I, I would say, uh, <laughs> I would take a cue from my teenager and just go, Ugh. yeah. No, I, but I, I would say to the overbearing friend, like, I just need you to listen to me. It's that's all. I just need you to listen to me, and um, that's it. There is no if you can't. It's mm. it's not an or else. I just need you to listen to me. It also is. You know, I, I went out with a comic last year for like seven months and I spent the next seven months every single day thinking about him. Mm-hmm. Every single day. I woke up going, when can I finally email him? Like when and I'm in my fucking fifties. Like, yeah. you know, but I felt him so deeply. Um I rarely talked about it to anybody because mm-hmm. I knew that um everyone had I had other things to think about and other things to talk about, but I was always thinking about him. Always. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like some people need to emote, you seem like you have to, and you should, you should be able to vocalize what's in your body, under your skin and your heart. And if your friend can't be there for you, move on, like go, like find another person. Don't let her be the only receptacle of all your feelings because it's, it's a lot of pressure to put on someone. It absolutely is. Um, that is a a very good point as well, is that. I, I admire people like you. I have to be. I don't know how you do that because I'm a, like, I just start vomiting. Like, the second that I, like, it, the second I have a feeling, I need to express it. So yeah, I, I like that about you. Thank you. I like that. My daughter's the same way. I, I, I learned it the hard way because I had, a like, a violent father mm-hmm. and a mother who couldn't deal with it. But but the biggest lesson was on 9-11 when, when the planes hit and the towers were falling and I had a a one-year-old baby on my breast like it is the most traumatic thing to like look out your window and see all the people walking up 7th Avenue covered in ash Mm -hmm. you're feeling all these feelings and yet like my body was the conduit to my daughter's sustenance and I just had to like shut down so and not put that energy in her and just stay Mm -hmm. joyful Wow. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a, it's not it's a learned behavior. It's not easy to do that. But again, then in relationships, I'm very honest and very like, yeah, let's keep talking. The guy I'm going out with now, he wants to talk about everything. Yeah. Does everything. it drive you nuts? Well, sometimes I'm like, oh, if we're not talking about our relationship, he actually has nothing to say. That's interesting, and I was going to ask you, how, how, does he ask you about how you're doing, or is it just like yeah. him talking about him? Yeah, every morning he, he texts me good morning. Uh-huh. He asks me how I'm doing. Um, last night I got a disturbing email from someone I'd been best friends with for almost 10 years who was like, I need to take a break from our relationship. Um, I have some resentments, and I was reading this to him, and, so, and then I was up till like 3 in the morning thinking about it, and I woke up today at 6.30, which is what I do every day to take care of the dog and, and take my daughter, um, make my daughter her lunch for school. And he texted me, and he's like, um, good morning, Marcel. And I'm like, hi. And he's like, did you sleep well? And I'm like, no, vampire in the house. I woke up at 3, and I mean, went to sleep at 3, and he was like, aw. And then just started asking me how I was feeling. So I'm so sorry. He's super attentive. He's like... He is the bones of what you want in a relationship in a man. That's like, good. He's great. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, it's I'm good. I'm so happy to hear that. But for he you. wants to talk about us all the time. <laughs> I will tell you. Yeah, I know it's very polyamorous. Um, lots of processing. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, I'm so sorry that you got that email. First of all, did you write back? Um. Yes, I wrote because I don't fight in email and I don't argue in email and I don't end relationships in email also in text I don't get into anything too personal so I wrote um I I'd like to talk about this she wrote back I don't want to I want to just do this in email. I can write you a long email and I wrote back can you just do this for me let's make a date and do this and like do this face to face so that's what we're going to do do you feel Sorry if I'm not supposed to be asking about this. Too. You can ask okay. anything you want. Okay. Um, I just, I, do, do you really want to be friends with someone that's going to do that to you? Well, you know, it's really funny because, um, again, like in marriages, friendships end. They come, they find their natural ending. Yes. And and I've had a number of uh, really friend breakups over the course of my lifetime that were not based in a business relationship. And I've had those too. 
But um, I've had very, in, you know, I have very intimate relationships with my girlfriends and my male friends, like super intimate, more intimate than I have in like romantic relationships. Like you and I mm-hmm. are more intimate than I am with my current boyfriend. Really? That's like, because I'm, I can just let you know everything that's inside me. Yeah. Even though we don't see each other or talk to each other very much. I'll, I'm super honest. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that about you. Um, and, and so... It hurts me when a relationship ends. It really does hurt me. I'm usually devastated. I mean, I'm, but this relationship has been ending for a long time. Yes, that's true. And it was I, just, a, I, I agree with you. It was a matter of time before I knew that she would do the coward move and just do the email instead of try to see me in person. And, and because, like, I've been in the middle of this book launch and these other things that are going on in my life, like, I haven't had time to deal with it. She probably thinks she did the brave thing I know. by emailing, yeah. which is the shittiest part of it. Um, it's a coward move. I would advise your all your listeners don't end something in a in an email. And it's good to have that boundary too about not. I always get a little bit like um, disturbed when people say like I don't talk about this sort of stuff over text. And sometimes I'm just like, well, like now you're making it a big deal. But that's a really good. That's exact. I mean, that's. I, just, I mean. We're better Spoilers writers. Impressed. We're better writers than we are speakers. Yes. Well, that's that's very true of me too. Is that I wrote someone an email recently. I wrote someone an email recently that I I kind of I didn't do this to someone. I just basically said like of record. Like I just want this to be on the record. Like I don't think that we should be working together on this anymore because basically like I like you too much as a person and I think we come in on really different levels like about where we're at like in in my level isn't better than yours it's just different and um she was like you know this is psychotic she oh, was, boy. and and uh well first I that's a huge pet peeve of mine is people calling each other crazy well by the way you're ending the business relation the way you did it is professional and the way to do it her response yeah is what I have umbrage with it's it becomes personal about your character as opposed to you're right we have different approaches to a work ethic here yeah and that's what it really was it was about work ethic it was that like I if I'm gonna do something I do it a certain way and that's just I know that it, it's when I don't give myself that experience of doing it the way that I know how to do it then it never works out it never works out and I really just wanted to cut that off at the past and because you know you know that I've had like complicated relationships with friends and business in the past. And I've learned a lot of lessons from those things. And and my favorite part of Please Advise, and actually it's almost ironic that I'm giving a talk on this, but not really, because I think (laughs) failure is where you learn um, everything. I mean, Hello Giggles, like, I don't think it's a gigantic secret that that was kind of like a personal disaster for me at the end. Like, it just, we weren't getting along anymore um, in some ways. And, um, I, like, I've never really, like, say that out loud, but just because, you know, it's not a big deal and also we're all fine now. But, like, there, were, there was a while where things were really hairy. And um, I learned a lot of lessons from that. And with Please Advise, I actually do this show with my best friend, Christina. And she's my real best friend of she's eight so years. She's so pretty and smart. Look at her right here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I miss her. I'm, I'm in her I'm home. T- I'm in her hometown without her. I feel like. I feel weird. No, no, no. Don't be. She is so pretty and smart, too. Um, So you're accurate. But, like, that was really, like, that was something I was trepidatious about at first. And I realized very quickly that this was going to be an entirely different work scenario. We're actually doing a talk at this big women's podcasting festival um, run by WMYC in L.A. Oh, I want to come. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, yeah. No, I know. (laughs) It's, It's in L.A. I know. And um, we're doing a talk about how to basically start a project with your friend and how to do it well. And I think that as someone who's been on both ends of it, I ha- I know now to recognize right away, like, is this going to be a good move for our friendship or is this going to be the end of us? Well, the important thing, you know, I started Bust in 1993 with a person that I was acquainted with. Well, I wouldn't have called her a friend. Right. But, you know, we had we were uh, same approaches to feminism and all this other stuff. And then we brought a third partner in. Again, I wouldn't call her a friend. I knew her. But where we went wrong and what I tell every single person that does a partnership with two other people, where we went wrong was we didn't put anything in writing. We didn't have defined roles. The third partner, who was not the co-founder, just someone, you know, someone we brought in. But at the very beginning, she was the designer. So she always had a role. But me and the co-founder, we were both creative. We were both brilliant. We were both like, you know, started this thing. We both had the same kind of talents and skills. And we both wanted to do the same thing, which was edit the magazine. 
and it it fell apart. I mean, I was there for seven years, and I got pushed out mm -hmm. because, like, you know, she, I had a baby, I got distracted as well I should have, and I was much happier. Um, and she just went, okay, I'm taking the magazine away from you, and I was just like, all right, well, I've got this baby, gotta go. Um, and it's because we never had to find roles. I remember you saying that to me a lot when I was going through all that stuff with Hello Giggles, and I remember being shocked at how similar it was because. The truth is, is that I never subscribed to this narrative that we always had to put out there, which is that we were three best friends who started a website. And I'm like, no, my best friends are Ed and Christina. And like, I Ed. like you. I know Ed's the best person in the world. I'm like, I really like you guys. But like, I don't know that we're even like friends yet, let alone best friends. And so there was that there was definitely that. That's definitely an important thing to recognize, too, to our caller before. Like, I think this is still the same call. <laughs> Not everyone's your friend. Like, no. that's the other thing, too. There's a very – it's a special word to use with someone, and it's a, it's an intimate relationship. And I don't have a lot of, like, tangential friends in my life anymore, people that, that – it's just like, oh, you know, they can come or go. Like, I don't really care. Like, we can go see a movie together. I don't go to the movies with people I don't like that much anymore. <laughs> that's a really important thing, you know. It's just – it's who you spend your time with is everything. Yeah, it's so true. Um, okay, let's do one last call, and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Hey, Malls. Hey, Christina. My name is Jamie. I am 22 and I live in Nashville. Um, I have a dating question for you guys. I recently ended things with a guy who I was casually seeing because the last time that we hung out, um, he said some pretty racist stuff, which is obviously a deal breaker for me. Um, I'm really into politics and I'm a super passionate feminist, so I'm pretty grossed out and disappointed in myself for, like, ever dating this guy. Um, but my question for you guys is, how do I find a boy to date who shares my political views? I'm really open about my beliefs, which I assumed would scare away the bigots, um, but apparently not. Um, I'm also new to the South, so I'm not sure if this is, like, just a hazard of living here or what. Um, so if you guys have any advice on what I should do, I would really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Love you guys. Oh, um, this is, like, one of my favorite questions ever. I'm so glad I that this this is, I picked this one for you because it, you could, a better person could not be here to answer this. Um, can I just say that I'm really proud of you for... A, getting out of this relationship the second that you realized what was going on because – and B, that I think that you're a very strong person. Um, I agree. Because there are a lot of people that – and I will say I've done this before too. Sometimes I've heard people say something and I have been so stunned by it that I didn't know how to react in the moment and I didn't know how to even react later. Like I just never said anything. And it, that can be a really – you know, I – I would. I always get mad when people are like, "Why didn't you, you know, report this person or do this?" And I'm like, "Because a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people are so stunned when something goes wrong that they don't know to speak out in the moment. So that's an amazing ability you have." And I had someone, um, someone tried to break into my place once, or so, no, it was after someone tried to like attack me, basically. And what? I and I scream. I know. And I was walking, and I screamed, and then the person ran, and. My best friend Ed said to me, you know, the good thing about this is that you know your instincts are right. He said because you screamed. Like a lot of people in situations like that, something happens and they freeze up and they don't do anything. And I was like, there, that is a positive. Like it was, you know, it was something that ended quickly and then I did. I had the right reaction and I wasn't scarred by it. I was able to move on. A lot of people um, can't do the right thing in the moment. So just be proud of that. Um, what do you think, girl? Well, you know, it's this is what I I consider dating like an interview process, and I I consider dating like the first three times you go on a date with the first three dates you go on, whether you sleep with them or not. Like you're just like asking all the questions, like blah 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 blah. It's really hard for a feminist to spot the leopard. You know, it's very the spots on the leopard. It's very hard for a feminist to do that because. You know, we we're egalitarian and we're open-minded, and we really do believe that that they're like the they're the best in everybody. Mm -hmm. It's and I do I do think like <laughs> I can't tell you how many guys pretended to be feminists just so they could fuck me. Yeah. Like you know, it's yeah. just like it's hilarious. Yeah. So you can't be too hard on yourself because like 
they don't come out with these bon mots until like a little bit further down the line. And then you're like, wait a second, did you just say that? Mm -hmm. And then you hear it again and you're like, all right, I got to go. My daughter just went through this like last year in junior year where she was like dating like the hottest guy who was like a dancer. His (laughs) body was insane. His face was chiseled. He was somebody you want to like physically would want to date, but then he would say these things about like gay people or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, my soulmate and best friend is a six foot four black man. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's her godfather. Like, you don't say anything about, you know, if you say something racist to me or my daughter, you are out. Mm -hmm. And he did that. And she was like, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, hook up with him anymore because he's just, he's a homophobe and he's a little bit racist. And I was just like, yo, you're doing the right thing. Like he could be hot, but like he hot is not everything. Good sex is not everything. Compatibility and like-minded values is everything. And you know, in terms of finding the right guy in the south, you, you're gonna keep you. You'll have some. You'll have some rough patches, but you're gonna find somebody if you're doing the online dating stuff. Like put on all of your profile, like no Trump supporter and like those trump guys or those you know those misogynists they're not going to look at you they're just going to be like no all right she doesn't we're not in the same boat um every so often one will try to trick you and you know like molly said you pat yourself on the back that you see it and you get out of it super fast because by the way there's you're 22 there's so many men ahead of you Mm -hmm. there's so many men there's so many men you don't need this one that's such a good – thank you for saying that. You're the best. Um, I, I do want to talk a, about that for a second, though, because I think that you brought up a really good point, which is that, like, as as a feminist, like, you want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, always. Like, to a, I have been called out on that on this podcast so many times because I'm just like, oh, like, I'm sure it's – you know, and then I get a million letters from people being like, actually, Malls, no. Um, oh. <laughs> How? What? What do you do with that? How do you protect yourself when that is the case? Because I think that it can be really hard to protect yourself when you want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. I think it's very important to not become bitter, mm-hmm. not to be cynical. I think skepticism is healthy. Cynicism and bitterness is is will just destroy your soul. There's nothing worse than a cynic. I have to be honest. I can't be around it. No. I don't. I just. It's just. I don't. I don't. People shock me sometimes with when they. Sometimes the view of life that they're – we had a guy on here once. He got through this entire call. I gave I gave a little thing at the top and then we went to him. And what I thought was just a strange dating scenario, he goes, Molly, the guy's a con man. And I was like, oh, what? And he was like, he's a con man. And I'm like, well, why would anyone do that? And it's like I, – I, it's – and it's a mixture of maybe naivete as well, but like I can, I just would never, my mind never goes to that thing. And I'm glad it doesn't, you know, I don't want to walk around like wrecking, you know, like Ruby with the cream thing. I was like, I fall for things like that all the time, all the time. Because yeah. why would someone do that? I don't, I don't yeah, know. You don't want to be 25 and go, all men are liars. Right. Get to 55. Right. Like, you know, like, you know, get, get further along down the line. There are good people that you will meet, that you will fall for, or just have sex with, mm-hmm. you know, that will be like-minded with you. It's, it's, like, it's like getting over a heartache. Like, it's not going to happen overnight. You have, to, you have a lot of work to do because there's a lot of mining. Um, I live in New York City. I, I've lost count of how many men I've slept with. But, like, I've, I've been with a lot of, and women, I've been with a lot of people. And it it's like all the people I've been with and there's just like five that are memorable. Mm-hmm. Five. Like, yeah. you know, and I can tell you who all them are and I can I know their last names. Right. And there's a reason they're memorable because like we connected on that level of like we're both feminists and we're both this and, you know, we both like Truffaut or whatever. We like mm-hmm. the stupid thing and pavement. You know, like we like the same things and that made us like, ah, bond. But um, it takes a while to find that person. Mm-hmm. Wow. Marcel, you're my favorite. I love you so much. I love your daughter so much. I'm so thankful to have you in my life. She was so excited to come see you. Oh, I'm so yeah, I'm so excited so I got excited. to see her. Like for I just I'm so proud of like you've done a remarkable job. Because PS by the way, you're the person that got her to be a writer on Hello Giggles. You're the person that remembered that 7-year-old who did Smart Girls at the party with Amy Poehler talking about feminism. You're the person that remembered that and then you found our mutual friend Justin and he 
connected you with me who was like who is this person and then I connected you with her who was like be my big sister because she's you know? a remarkable person oh, thank you. you know she thank really you. you've raised a remarkable young woman and I'm sure you know that you probably hear it all day and you know what I loved about someone said to her when we were Michelle Collins said this as she was leaving um Ruby handled something so gracefully she goes um Michelle was like oh I love your mom and I think that I would have been like oh like yeah or something. She goes, I know, I do too. Aww. And I was just like, wow. Like that, first of all, I love that Ruby Lake is ready to go. Like she knows what to say in a moment, but also that she can vocalize that and like not, you know, I just thought it was very sweet. It was a very like cute thing that I just caught randomly. Oh, Most people I'm would not so, say that. I'm so glad you repeated that. I didn't catch that at all. We're so close. Mm-hmm. We're so close. And I mean, I, of course I adore her, but like I, I really am so lucky that she is such an awesome person. Yeah, she's a remarkable person, and that is largely because of you. Mm-mm. Um, well, my friend, where can people find you online? We should plug Ruby's stuff because she didn't get to do that before she left. She's just at Ruby Carp, right? RubyCarp.com. Her website is all complete, but like her, 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 where you see her the most is on Instagram. Her Instagram mm-hmm. is Ruby Carp. She's got this book coming out uh, October third called Earth Hates Me. Please pick it up. We, you know, we want. If you know a teenager, if you know a person that's going through a heartbreak, she's got five steps to heart, uh, getting over a heartbreak in her book. Uh, if you know a teenager, a girl who's like struggling, a girl who's happy, she could use this book. This is a survival guide to becoming a teenager. So rubycarp.com, rubycarp on Instagram, rubycarp on Twitter. And I'm blogging at barbmagazine.com. Uh, I have a Instagram, that's Barb Magazine. I have a Twitter, that's Barb Magazine. I actually have 20 followers on my Twitter, so if you follow me, that'd <laughs> be awesome. I will follow you right now. Um, because I really do focus on the Instagram. I like the pictures. They're yeah. so nice. No, it's a great medium. And I'm just so proud. This is like, I'm, I could like cry. This makes, this, I could gasp. Wait I mean, till you read like the part where I tell her about my dad dying and like how she handled it. It's just, it's so beautiful. I, mm-hmm. I literally, I was just like, and then when you read the dedication to me, it's just like, Oh, like I didn't know. I didn't read the book until I was on a plane coming back from a wedding Mm -hmm. because she didn't want me to read it while she was working on it. Um, But I read it like at the like and I was just I was crying on the plane. I was like, oh, she wrote that to me. Oh, my God. Yeah, I can't read this right now. I'll cry. Yeah, it'll (laughs) make you cry. It's too much. Um, Yeah, I'm just you guys. And by the way, like. This is obviously not just for teenagers. I'm so excited to read this myself. And there's like, I think a sense of nostalgia that's like, you just will never forget this traumatizing time in your life. Um, I remember someone saying to me once I was pitching a movie and I was like, it's a high school thing. And the guy said, you know, oh, we need something bigger than high school, like a bigger life event. And I said, there's no bigger life event. I'm like, you're telling me like you nerdy motherfucker (laughs) that you don't do everything you do in life. Because of high school. It's the relationships you have, the things, everything is, it's such, it's the most influential time in your life. Wish that wasn't true, but I think it is. Maybe motherhood's greater. It's the one, it's probably the most influential experience I've had to date. Um, College is great. You figure it out. I loved college. I think she's, no, she, I went to college. I didn't care so much about it, but um, thank you so much for having both of us. This was a treat. I wasn't expecting to be on it. And um, you've been such a huge part of our lives. You've really, changed so much in my daughter's life and I can't thank you enough. It, it's like literally my pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to take that compliment. Thank you. you. Um, I never do normally. I love you so much. Let's um, let's go hang out for a minute. I think I have a minute. Do you have a minute? Yep. Okay, cool. Shh. 